Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us on our um, Object Matrix and Autonomy Media Group webinar, um, where we're gonna talk about the advanced orchestration of media workflows uh, using Matrix Store, Vision, and Cubix. Um, the webinar is being recorded, but please do feel free to um, unmute yourselves and ask questions or put any questions in the chat window. Um, we'll keep an eye on it uh, and let you know the answers as we're going along. Um, so my name is Mark Haberfield. I am the pre-sales engineer here at Object Matrix. Uh, and on the line with me, we have James Gibson. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Hi, guys. Hope Good. you can all hear me okay. Yep, loud and clear, loud and clear. Perfect. Um, so unlike your typical webinar, we're not going to do the deep dive into who we are. Um, I think you by now all know who Object Matrix are, um, company out of Wales, uh, doing a lot for object storage in media workflows, and Portana Media Group, uh, working out of London, helping media management and media orchestration. The products, again, most of you should know them already, Matrix Store, <clears throat> that media-focused object storage, the private and, uh, private and hybrid cloud uh, platform that's built for media workflows. And uh, specifically, for every dollar you spend on Matrix Store, you should be earning $2 back in your creative workspaces or saving time with automation. I'll let James tell you a little bit more about Cubix while we're here. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, so hopefully, um, as Mark's mentioned, we've already done a webinar uh, where we've done a bit of a deep dive into um, the two products and the the integrations that we have. Um, just very briefly, though, for those who aren't too familiar with um, with Autana and Cubix, um, Autana Media Group was started in 2012, and we launched our uh, media asset management and orchestration platform, uh, Cubix. And I kind of heave when I say the word MAM. Uh, we're not a fan of uh, MAM. We really see ourselves as a, a media orchestrator, um, just because MAM nowadays has become uh, quite old hat as to the requirements. You know, we everyone has to manage assets, but it's it's quite another thing to uh, then orchestrate them. And that's really where we focus is on the the orchestration. So as you can see by a lovely wheel we have up here on the screen, Cubix has a lot of different use cases uh, that we have deployed today, and these are all actual deployments and products that we have. Uh, these aren't, you know, sort of it could do type uh, setups. Um, the key thing really with Cubix is it's very modular, it's very scalable, uh, and we mean that both from a commercial perspective, but also from a technical perspective. So you'll notice on the screen here, we have things like our uh, editorial ingest, our avid ingest solution, uh, AI content discovery, robotic book ingest, and so forth. These things are available as appliances, uh, which means you can license them on a, a basis just for that capability. So the, the transcoder is probably quite an appropriate one and key for today. Um, but also then obviously the Cubic stack as a whole uh, can be used across. And, and the key thing is you're only running the elements you need. Uh, not only do you only license what you need, but also you only run the bits you need and critically where you need to run them. Um, so Cubic can be deployed entirely on-prem, entirely in the cloud. Uh, it is also a true hybrid. So we can run the bits again where we need them next to the bit of kit we need. So the notion of really you know, cloud and on-prem or main and backup starts to fade away uh, and everything's designed to be uh, highly fault tolerant. So we run it as an active active type um, setup for controlling bits of kit. Um, over 54 integrations under the hood now. Uh, and obviously key one we have is both with Matrix Store and Fission. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, well. I mean, we're here for the workflows today. We're here to understand what you guys can do with your matrix store, your vision, and Cubix driving in the background. Um, so workflow number one, simple thing, generating the vision proxies. The choice of your proxy, um, completely configurable rasters, completely configurable with thumbnails or watermarks, logos, et cetera. Uh, but the fact that it supports so many different formats, um, you know, the, the LUTs can be applied, ARRI, RED, Blackmagic Design, image sequences, basically anything you can put on the Matrix Store, we like to think that uh, Cubix will be able to transcode it. And I can show you that. Uh, you should by now be quite familiar with your vision interface. Um, you've got your vaults on the left-hand side, the main assets in the middle, uh, and um, all the metadata on the right-hand side. And in here, you can see we've got some lovely assets that are various formats that came out of various cameras, various um, codecs that have all been transcoded and make them completely playable by vision. And of course, once you've got a playable asset, you've got the ability to do a lot more with it. You'll be able to um, know what you want particularly out of it, uh, as well as find it, preview it, and decide how you want to use it within the workflow. 
So just on, on the point there, Mark, I mean, we do support all the uh, sort of major camera formats, including RAW formats. So that does include uh, ProRes RAW, Canon, Blackmagic, uh, ARRI, RED. Um, we also understand and can process image sequences. So if you have any uh, sort of DPX uh, or just new standard image, you can straight over camera. Um, we do support those as well. Um, and I'm I right in saying, Mark, that we can have um, a 4K proxy if we wanted. You know, the, the playback really is just down to the the browser. So we could have a uh, you know 4K HDR, um, obviously display allowing, but you know sort of 4K quality. And we can also uh, again based on configuration. And we're going to kind of keep saying that today. So I think we we'll just say that across everything we're going to we're going to talk about. Um, you can really configure what we call the media rules that that generate these proxies, uh, and they can have settings as regards to yeah bitsies, watermarking, overlays, uh, and that can vary based on uh, you know the 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 vault or even the location they're in. So you don't have to be, uh, you know, one size fits all. It can be a bit more nuanced as to uh, what kind of proxies we generate. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, any uh, any proxy, whatever you really want, whatever's best for your business, um, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, and all working directly out of the matrix store um, to make it nice and quick. So the second workflow we'll move on to is the the cubic transcode in into house into habit or preferred format. Um, basically, it's the ingest workflow. Ingesting using the cubic score and the harnesses, um, allowing those matrix store assets to become again delivered to the matrix store um, with the added benefits of metadata and other bits and bobs. So we basically set ourselves up a nice ingest feed. Uh, we basically started taking an, uh, an MRSS feed, uh, grabbed all the assets that were coming in on it, and we just started proxying them up. So you can see, um, not only did we copy the feed, the, the original assets in, we've got the original assets coming into the matrix store, straight away the Cubics engine was generating the proxy and the thumbnail. Um, now the beauty of that is we've also then extracted some of the metadata, so matrix store extracted that metadata, but you could allow or you could choose for Cubics to actually start embedding that metadata as well. Um, it's all uh, in the matrix store and we can even add metadata ourselves. We could decide if this is the clip we really want. Uh, we're going to add a bit of information about it. And uh, it gives us that extra ability to then start using more of the features and finding the assets. So again, not only could we just be searching on file names, we can actually then be searching on the metadata as well, returning those results. And of course, the advanced search features within uh, Vision now allow you to search all vaults, uh, even subfolders or even use a fuzzy search. So, you know, if you've got a, a spelling mistake or you're not quite sure how something's spelled, switch on fuzzy search and it's a good chance you'll find the asset uh, with either that metadata on it or with the information and the name on there. It's just key to mention on that that integration. I mean, here we've done an MRSS feed just as an example. Um, Cubics can ingest from a very wide range of uh, different sources, um, everything from uh, remote storage to things like S3, Backblaze, and so forth. Obviously, MRSS, uh, even social media, we can do ingesting off things like Facebook and YouTube for, for video assets. Um, but also then, you know, other uh, storage types that we have uh, integrations with. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge kind of list that we can trigger from. Uh, and really here, we say we're also normalizing the asset into a, a prioritization. HQ, I think is that right, Mark, we've been seeing here. Um, so yeah, these are all coming yeah. in a different variants, but here you can see that we've not only created the proxy stuff and everything else, but we've also done a normalization uh, to bring it down to like a common house format. Um, so again, that's an automatic process that can be done. Um, and if we're working with a source that provides more than just an asset, if it does provide metadata, uh, again, we can actually populate the metadata directly in Vision. So you get that persistence all the way through uh, into the Vision UI to then obviously then be to use on the search and filtering as uh, Mark mentioned. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, ingest and transcoding workflow number two. Uh, workflow number three is using vision for that partial file resource or, or subclipping, depending on which side of the pond you're on. Um, this has actually been driven by our customers. Obviously, they don't want to be pulling back the, the giant um, sports videos that are four hours long. They just want that two minute clip, kit clip where it's got the important bit of information. Now, this again has developed over time. So not, you know, previously it was just a simple um, click in, click out, and now we've added more to it. So the player itself now supports JKL. Uh, we can change the time format um, to whichever one of the speeds we require um, to get it more accurate uh, and the exact part we want. We can choose whether we're gonna be clipping 
um, in time code, frames, seconds, milliseconds, or time. But the essentials are we switch on the clip in, drag it into the, the bit of the video that we actually want. In this case, I'm going to take a really short one just so it does it super quick. Uh, hit the clip button. I can rename it. I can also tell it where to deliver, um, although in this case, I've got it delivering to a specific place. And straight away, that's going to go off using the API, tell the Cubix engine we want to turn this into a subclip, and uh, Cubix will take that away and generate that clip for us. We even got it tied into the feed now, so you can now see the, the object itself is telling you how long it's going to take to do that sub clip as well, with the little clip symbol and a little timer going away there nicely in the background. So, yeah, so on that one, obviously, the key difference there is whereas before, Mark, on the previous ones, we were very much triggering yourself with the APIs and triggering your APIs and making things happen in Vision and Matrix Store. Obviously, that's the first demonstration, really, within a true response where you're able to trigger our APIs. Um, and I think I think actually is I'm right understanding there's a the scope for quite a few as we're going to see some more happening, but you know, there's the scope for more generic integration to occur quite soon where you'll be able to trigger effectively almost any workflow that we have configured in Cubix from Vision. Is that right? Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. And we're kind of stepping into the next one now, um, which is our trigger transport tasks, either from within Vision or from in watch folders. Um, so exactly that vision itself has uh, the drop downs. Those drop downs are now um, allowing us to configure these to be sent to dot 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 or restore from dot dot dot. Um, I can also use the standard watch folders as well. So I can actually just take this asset. I could copy this asset into a watch folder that we've already got set up um, in my cubic transport vault. And that allows us to do exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, I've set up a folder which is going to anything that lands in there is going to be converted um, and part of the workflow is then to package it up and deliver it to that bit of storage um, and as I said that drop down uh, is starting with the API integration to allow that send to uh, in this case backblaze or avid or wherever you like cool So this is kind of uh, what we call the supply chain side of things, uh, where we're using Vision to you know, send it into an online storage or a package delivery or the end of the workflow off to a public cloud, for example. Um, we've also got Vision being used in more of an archive workflow, kind of seamlessly bringing all the, the storages together. Single pane of glass management side of things. So again, Ortana has got the ability to scan existing storages um, or data you've got elsewhere and just create the proxy and the stub on the matrix store. If I set an item into my S3 bucket, that's going to upload into there. It's going to kick off an SQS SQS task from Amazon. It's going to notify um, the Cubix call that there's an asset there ready to go. It's worth mentioning in all these uh, different methods of monitoring. I mean, it's going to be everything from uh, Nexus storage, Store Next. Uh, you know, the HSMs, things like Black Pearls and Data, obviously the cloud providers, as your S3, as your Glacier, uh, we do support all the different classes. Um, all of these can be figured, can be configured, should I say, as regards to prioritization, um, but also uh, such properties as well as, you know, what uh, file extensions we should support. Uh, and again, where the proxies are generated can be done appropriately. So obviously, if you've got assets that are in um, S3, you know, we can on-demand uh, do proxy generation uh, within the S3 cloud, within your own uh, VPC, so there's no egress fees. And obviously, then we can then generate that uh, proxy locally then uh, on the uh, on you know, Envision. So that way, then you can have a true stub uh, without having to do any form of large file uh, egress. Um, so we can also, when we're talking about this, um, when it comes to the way that our system works for monitoring locations or, or doing integrations, um, it's a completely abstracted layer within our automation system. Um, and this allows us to run those elements where we need to, again, so we can actually scale very large. There's no limits practically as to how many transcript nodes you could add into this. Um, but also as well, when it comes to where they're lo located, they don't have to be next to um, you know, the vision vault. So if you do have, uh, you know, an AB site setup, or you have a vault which is remote to you know, the, the asset you're wishing to stub, um, then it's very easy for us to try and stub in situ, and then obviously create that proxy and metadata. Uh, and then it's quite then an easy process of then requesting a, a restore to bring that online. 
Yeah, and yeah, that restore is as easy as, uh, like I said, drop down, restore. I actually pre-configured this one to restore from here. So I can press restore. That'll trigger the Cubix API to go and now bring that back from S3 to the matrix store. Um, it'll take a little bit of time, but you know, it, 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 it depends on how many nodes, you know, um, how many um, engines you've got running in the background, but it'll get there eventually and get all that data for us. So kind of bringing it all together, um, we're going to tell you a little bit about one of our customers um, who has this in in house. They've uh, been using it for a little while now, um, but they've obviously they've had Matrix Store for five six years now, uh, and they've been slowly growing the workflows and improving them. And one of the recent improvements was where we added Cubix into the workflow. So the content is acquired and the proxies are generated. Well, that was workflows one and two. Um, then within Vision, the users uh, are reviewing the content and they're adding extra metadata and they're making it, you know, deciding what they need, what they want for the next step. The next step is that then they trigger within the Cubix core the content to be delivered to their Avid Nexus. This is workflow number four, delivering it. And where the Cubic transcodes uh, are making the Avid offline media, the XD cam, and complete with all the AAF and PM PMRs. So, you know, that also includes the metadata that they've entered in the matrix store as well. So we're delivering that metadata into the Avid bin also. So making it really, really easy for the for the editors to actually get the assets uh, at the end of it. Um, one of their recent projects was really pretty successful, but it took in all different types of medias from end users. Um, so it's really a good test of all of the different formats that uh, Cubix is able to transcode and then turn into uh, a fully Avid project. Yeah, and I think there's there's a couple of key points just to bring to life there, Mark. I mean, the first off is, you know, Cubix is able to do a complete lights out workflow um, for the quote unquote ingest of content into uh, Avid. Now, this is outside of any interplay. We do work with interplay if you have interplay, um, but most of our clients are users, you know, just pure media composer with Nectus. Um, so we're able to generate the offlines. Um, they have the suitable metadata for relinking as part of an AMA relinking, um, but also little things that will generate, you know, an AF per role, for example as well as generate a little file called a PMR, permanent media record, which allows Media Composer to instantly open AS without any indexing time. Um, so literally, it is a case of, you know, trigger from within Vision, um, and then all of that media appears on your, uh, your allocated nexus in the right format without any human effort whatsoever. So that in itself is, is quite a key feature um, that are quite keen people to sort of take away today that Cubix as our, our transcode module uh, can be used for what we call a, a editorial ingest or avid ingest. Um, but then further still, um, exactly that, leveraging the benefit of vision. Um, you know, we had this particular project had content coming in from all around the world. Um, and so they were able to review easily that user generated content, rate it, provide keywords and comments. And then we're able to persist all of that down into the metadata that appears within the uh, AF within the media bin. Um, so obviously the editor then can very quickly and easily work with that offline content and get a feel for what assets best, you know, based on the rating and the metadata that's done. And of course, then subsequently with the render that's done, of course, we can then be pushing that back into Matrix Store um, for the onward distribution. So hopefully trying to bring to life a bit the, the notion that these workflows we've demonstrated today are really just that. They are example workflows. This one is obviously a very live and real one. Um, but these workflows are truly, truly configurable. I'm very happy to show you um, to sort of see how you easily you can trigger, sorry, configure and tweak these workflows as best to uh, as best to suit yourselves. Um, so by no means think that these are the only, you know, six or seven workflows the system can do, far from it. Um, we're just hopefully trying to cover a bit of a spectrum here to give you a taste of what they could be capable of doing. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, jointly, we've got a live document and I think I probably add two or three workflows to it every week um, just <laughs> yes. to <laughs> help James Absolutely. out with, <laughs> with the thoughts. And of course, James then tells me how we, we configure it um, out there. Um, just a reminder that we've also got the the LTO migration um, out there as well. The ability to use your Matrix Store uh, to turn your cold offline LTO archive um, and all of its metadata into a live um, private cloud Matrix Store um, one, and again, completely automated, completely lights out uh, within the system. So, yeah. and I think a key point on, on that is that the migration doesn't have to just be, you know, moving of data. The key thing for us when we're going off an archive is that we, you know, we understand there's usually a transformation you want to do. So whether that be the regeneration of proxies, uh, maybe doing an AI pass or something, uh, you know, there can be several steps you want to take when moving from your legacy HSM 
to you know matrix store but also to other mixtures as well so we could be targeting you know a matrix store on prem you know, make sure cloud or other mixes of uh, cloud storage. Uh, and again, that's all rules driven based on the, the content type, extensions, all that kind of thing. So it can be very, very uh, detailed as to, you know, what action is taken. It doesn't have to be a you know, simple A to B shift. Yeah, so we've talked about it. So let's go see if it's actually happened, shall we? Um, shall I nip into the Cubix engine quickly? So this is the, the, the administration in the background. Um, I won't dive too deep. I'll just quickly check uh, are my task flows running uh, and have they completed. So we mentioned the MRS feed. That's there. But I also did a uh, S3 to Vault stub. Let's have a quick search and see if it picked that up. Uh, yeah, there it is. Test MP4. That's uh, still in process. Uh, so that will still be working away in the background. Uh, and I normally see the information on the right hand side. So it's halfway there. It's picked it up. It's processing it. It'll probably deliver it. Uh, and if you pretty... if you scroll down on that for me, Mark, you should see the individual elements there. So what are we waiting on if we scroll down? Sure. I think I think it's literally about to. Uh, they've all just finished. <laughs> I think it's about to pick up any moment and and send through. So okay, good stuff. Uh, and that sub clip we did as well. Let's just quickly see partial restore. I root search again we should see that one yeah that one that top top that's one. complete that's back in that's also completed and again we can see the history what it's done uh, in the background uh, as well um i'll quickly just show you the task flow designer as well i uh, might as well nip in here yeah so what look. what mark's been looking at there is our, our task interface that's a bit of a user interface as regards to interacting with the workflows so task flow is when we say task flow it's quite literally workflow we call it task flow and through our uh, flows or journeys we put down tasks um, and those journeys are very easily uh, defined so as Mark can see this is our this is the example MRSS one we're doing so here you can see we're doing the, the fetch the import and uh, subsequent transcodes for the actual uh, normalization of the asset the proxy transcodes and then the obviously that onward delivery into uh, matrix store and vision um, so this is the workflow that's been configured and um, by no means is this obviously hard coded or, or is set in any way and mark could very easily if he clicks on one of those plus signs um, and or drags or drops you know he can easily drag and drop in a, a status across here add new steps and you'll notice the key thing with our designer and for those who want to be familiar with it is our approach is quite different to others we don't try and show the entire workflow on the screen at the same time what we show is a linear approach so that's the uh, white arrows you can see there and every success step we have a fail state so what happens is if we have, for example, a validation step or a transcode step and it fails, what we can then do is on the branch, we can then go into another branch in itself, which can then you know, obviously handle that exception and then can branch again and again. The simplest way of thinking about it is kind of concentrating on what should happen before then dealing with the, the what ifs. Um, so the statement is configurable, the processes we add in are configurable. So all of the workflows you've seen working today have been built using the exact same methodology using our task for designer. Um, but as you can see, they can, uh, if you look on our website, you'll see we have over say 54 integrations now. So these workflows can drive any of those vendor elements we have as well as obviously our own core elements for you know, transcoding and asset management. So it's a very, very flexible stack. Um, which we thought has been very nicely integrated into Vision. Great. Well, we just had a quick question in the chat there. Does it allow Media Composer users to archive their projects, including all the media files, folders, graphics, etc.? Yes, it absolutely can, because we're managing the uh, Nexus storage. Um, we can actually take that, and then we have an integration with uh, Matrix Store where we can obviously create the objects in the metadata, so we can actually store back onto Matrix Store all of the project information as well as the media files, and then we can manage that restore back as well. Um, we're quite new at that. We generally focus on the actual content management rather than the project management, and if you will, project parking, which is very much what I just described there. It is a capability that it has. Uh, I would say it's sort of younger in its maturity. Most of our focus with uh, ingest clients has really been around um, billing. One of the key things, the kind of clients we're using it, and uh, Halo is a good example, is obviously they may have a number of different clients who are using uh, their solution for ingest. And one of the problems that's been, chal you know, historical challenges has been where media is being tracked on Excels and volumes are being tracked on Excels. You know, the billing of that could be quite difficult because Cubix has these workflows and because we're intimately understanding each asset going through. So we know to the byte, to the frame, exactly what happened and when. As you saw from the interface was Mark was showing you, you can see not only who did that, but what did that and, and you know, it's all audited. Um, what it means is that our reporting capability is uh, quite good. If we then extend that further, um, we have support for rate cards. Uh, 
so we can actually bake rate cards into our workflows. So for example, if I have a, a tiered system of my ingest, so if I'm just ingesting some red content, I'm using tier one versus some GoPro, whatever, it's tier three. So I can actually then start producing reports and metrics that allow me to see not only one content's come in, but also you know, how much storage has been allocated to that project, how much the customer's paid for, um, you know, how many hours of a set tier we've ingested and so forth. So it, it's really a two-step process. The main focus though for our uh, Avid ingest clients has really been around one of actually automating the ingest, but but critically the the second point, as I say, is on that reporting capability. Um, we have another client in Soho who already has Route Six, very happy with Content Agent. Um, one of those integrations that Cubix has is Content Agent. Um, so again, we can actually orchestrate an existing transcode tool. Um, and the key reason the client did that was again that reporting and capability uh, around the top. Um, so to answer your question, yes, it can. Um, but I'd be lying if I'm saying that's really where the focus is. Its focus is really upon like I say, that multi-client, uh, you know, uh, multi-workstation, multi-project, multi-nexus, you know, we're talking uh, large-scale ingest um, that can easily scale and contract, but be, vision, excuse me, be driven directly uh, from vision now as well with that great uh, additional benefit of the metadata exchange. So, yeah, we were just looking at the results. Uh, we can see uh, my subclip that I made is there, ready to go, um, and also my scanned S3 object. Uh, it's still not popped up, but it no doubt will get here very, very shortly. Yeah, we only have a one test VM running here. Normally, we would uh, run across our harnesses across multiple nodes, as mentioning, so we could scale up our transcoding capability. It's fair to say on our little demo here with Mark, we are <laughs> slightly starved of uh, compute for transcoding. Are there any questions anyone has on any of the workflows we've we've looked at, or if there's anything in particular on the, the Cubix or Vision side they'd like to understand more about? I think we've done a good job, Mark. Everyone seems happy. All asleep, yeah. one, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's uh, it's all demo and it's all workflows that we've uh, either discussed with customers or we, we, we are thinking about deploying with customers or have actually been deployed with customers. So you, you're safe in the knowledge that uh, they will work with our customers and should you need to use them uh, with your matrix store and your vision and your Cubix going forward. Okay, there's no more questions. I'll just uh, thank thank you, James, for joining me on the presentation. Um, no if there are any questions, please do get in contact. Um, you, you know where we are um, and you know our email address and we'll happily talk this through and uh, demo it directly uh, for you anytime you want uh, out in reasonable hours. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, I mean, I think just to mention that point, you know, that we have learnt over the years the system was growing through uh, customer exposure, customer feedback, uh, you know, partner feedback as well, um, and you know, we're constantly learning. So we do appreciate a good workflow challenge. So if you do have, if you're a client yourself looking at the solution, or if you're a you know a channel or reseller who's uh, potentially got a use case here where you think could be a good fit, you do give us a call. Um, we will happily demo this uh, directly, but we'll also give you access to test systems to play with. Um, we also do uh, a full statement of works process uh, without any commitment from yourselves. Um, we find that's quite a key part of our sales cycle because we like to understand intimately uh, you know, the, the needs of your workflow and ensuring that our tool can uh, do that. Uh, and it's also just a great exercise often to go through um, even just an internal one to get a better understanding of your workflow needs um, because often you can start in one place and end up you know adding in three more as you realize what capability and, and benefit you get from from orchestration um, so yeah please don't hesitate to contact us I'm, I'm more than happy to demonstrate uh, any of these workflows or any of the potential new ones that you may be looking for great Thank you very much, uh, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, the recording will be available shortly afterwards, and uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Cool. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Cheers.